Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Before we get started today, I wanted to announce that we've created the Symphony POS Support Facebook group. This is a group that is free to join for everybody if you would like to discuss the Symphony POS system and hospitality in general. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. And with that small announcement out of the way, let's get into today's video. I wanted to discuss some very useful features that are implemented in Symphony that are not used very often. I think some of these can help speed up work and improve customer service. So let's get started. First, let's discuss some employee features. So for this, I'm going to go ahead and sign into the workstation. And I think this feature will be very useful for bartenders. Imagine you're going to start a tab when somebody approaches the bar. A lot of times the bartender will identify the guest either by a table number or by a specific identifier such as red hat or something similar. So I'm going to begin a table with that name and then order a drink for him. And go ahead and send it. Now, using a guest check ID like that might be very useful for the bartender because they can just read it here and identify all the guests at the bar. The bad part is that this name actually prints on the guest check. So when you are presenting it to the guest at the end of their stay, they might be offended by it. So what I would recommend is as they're sitting there and enjoying their beer, I would strike a small conversation with them and ask them what their name is. And after you learn that, you can just enter the check and then go to your functions and click guest check ID. So let's say that their name was Joe. You're just going to enter Joe. And now that name red hat was replaced by Joe. And all you have to do is click send. This will help the bartenders remember the guest names and it will also present a personalized check resulting in better service and higher tips. This next feature will mostly be encountered by servers. So I'm going to go ahead and begin a table here. It's going to be table number one and imagine you have a larger party arriving, but the first guest arrived by themselves. So you start a table for one guest and they say just I'm going to just order a drink until I wait for everybody else. So they come and they order a beer and then you send the check. As the rest of the party arrives, it's a good idea to change the number of guests. So now we have just one here. We'll have to adjust it, go to our functions area and click change number of guests and then transform this, for example, into a six stop. The reason why that is important is because it will make reporting a lot more accurate. So that way we know exactly the number of covers we had for the night and the average spend for each guest. This next feature is used quite often both by bartenders and servers alike, but I wanted to add a couple of things to it. So I'm going to begin a transaction here for two guests and I'm going to add two appetizers, one for seat one and one for seat two. And then for drinks, I might add for them a bottle of wine. So I'm going to go to my wines here, select the bottle and then click OK and then send it. Now, a lot of times you see where guests require a split check and that's perfectly fine. We would go to our functions here. We would go to split check and split up the nachos, for example, and then save and then exit. We're going to enter one guest remaining on this check and go ahead and send it. And now we have two separate checks. One has one of the appetizers and the wine on it and one has the other appetizer. But what if we would like to merge these checks? We can open up one of them, go back to the functions area, click the merge checks key, select the check that we're going to merge it with, click OK, and now the check is back together. So like I said, splitting checks, I see it very often, but sometimes if the server makes a mistake and splits it incorrectly, the merge check is not used that often, leaving the guest to figure out on their own what happened. Another option hidden within the split check functionality is the share check item. As we can see, we have the two appetizers here and a bottle of wine. If the guest would like to share all these and just split it in two equal halves, we can select all of the items, click share check, and then we have these two checks side by side. We're going to select to share between both of them and then click yes. So now one person has half of everything and the other person has half of everything. And as you can see, the checks are $66.34 each. 
But what happens if they do not want it as an equal split? Since the two appetizers have different prices, they might want each person to pay for their own appetizer. So the tuna is $15 and the nachos are only $12. So I'm gonna split the tuna here and then they share the bottle of wine. So I'm only gonna share this one item. So I'm gonna select it, click share. Again, tell the system to share the bottle of wine between the two checks and then just click yes. So now one person has just their food item and half a bottle of wine and the other person has their food item and the bottle of wine. For the next feature, I wanna talk about seat positions. If your restaurant is a classic sit down style, you could consider using seat positions. So that means every time a guest orders an item, you have to enter the seat position. So the ahi tuna is gonna be for seat one, the chicken nachos is gonna be for seat two, and the quesadilla is gonna be for seat three. Now, using seat positions like that helps with expediting the food. When the food arrives at the table, if you have the ticket with you, you don't have to auction the food and ask who had the nachos, who had the tuna. You know exactly where to place it. That is already a great advantage and a great reason to use seat positions because it's gonna create a much better customer experience. But besides that, there are quite a few functions that also take advantage of seat positions that can help us out when we have to give the guest their check. So let's go to the functions area and let's take a look at those. So the first thing I wanna note is the edit seat button. For example, if I added the quesadilla on a different seat by mistake, I can just click edit seat and then change it. And then I can move this around just like I would do with a split check. The next function is to split the check by seat. So if you have a big party and you have everybody's drinks and food on the correct seat, you can just click split check by seat and the system will do the split for you if they want separate checks. You don't have to individually do it. There's also a filter seat button. What this will do is if you wanna take a look at all the items that one particular seat had, for example, I wanna see only items that were placed on seat one, I can see them here in the guest check detail area. This helps out a lot, especially if you have a very large party and you don't remember if you added an extra drink or an extra food item. To clear that, we're just gonna click filter seat and then just answer yes, and now all of our menu items are back. There's also an option to print seat check. This will print individual checks for all of the people seated. So again, you don't have to do the whole process of splitting checks. So using seat positions, if the restaurant allows it, again, I wanna make that clear because some of the restaurants are so fast paced that using seat positions might hinder service. But if your restaurant does allow it, then I would highly suggest using it as it will create a much better customer experience and once the servers get used to them, it will be very helpful for them at the end when they have to split checks and offer guest checks. The next function that I wanna cover is the increment employee shift function. What this does is basically it resets your entire shift to zero. So right now, if I go and run my employee report, you're gonna see that I have totals recorded against this shift. So let's say that this is my lunch shift, but I will have to work a double and also work for dinner. What I would do then is go and increment my employee shift and then answer yes. And then if I go back to my employee report, it, everything gets reset back to zero. Now, this is very useful, for example, for tip outs and for cashing out. If I'm gonna cash out at the end of my lunch shift and then tip out based on my net sales off of lunch, I'll be able to do that and then I'm not gonna be confused with my dinner shift where I'll have to do a different checkout and a different tip out. And finally, the last employee function that I'm gonna discuss is the declare cash tips button. Some restaurants actually go to the trouble of implementing a separate different system to declare cash tips for employees. So there is a button that's already integrated into Symfony and all they have to do is just push it and then just enter the amount of cash tips they made for that day and everything gets tracked in reporting so they don't have to worry about keeping this track manually or getting a separate system to do that. Next, I wanna cover a few manager functions. To do that, I'm just gonna click on my functions key and go to my manager functions area. And the first function that I wanna cover is the menu item availability. 
Now, a lot of times I see this item used just to 86 a menu item. So basically telling the servers that it's not available anymore. But what it can also be very useful besides just 86 in an item, we can go to the chef and if we have any particular menu items that we tend to run out, for example, let's say that the smoked salmon is in very limited quantity, what I can do is I can select the menu item and then click edit. And then we can either say that this menu item is out of stock or 86, or we can say that there are only 10 portions available, for example. Now, what that will do is put a little countdown timer on the button itself so the servers themselves know that there are only a few of these items left. So as this number goes down, as orders come through, let's say that there is only one salmon left, then if the server sees that and they go to a table and two people order the salmon, they will say, you know, guys, just hold on one second. I think we have just one left. And then they can verify if they have it or not, rather than just kind of going back and forth and saying, you know, the salmon is 86. We don't have it anymore. Can you guys order something else? The next function I want to talk about is the menu item price override. So I'm going to add two menu items here, one for position one and then one for position two. And then I'm going to go to my functions area. And here in the manager functions, I have this button called menu item price override. Now, what this does is basically overrides the price of the menu item as a one time change. So this will not change the entire price of the menu item in the database. It will only affect the menu item here in the check. So what I can do is click this button and then I can change this scallops appetizer to make it $8, for example. Now, as an alternative, you can offer this as a discount. And if you need to change the price of the menu item, you could add a $2 discount but that's not going to be very obvious to the guest for which item is it. And it might look a little different and it might uh, raise a few eyebrows and ask, why did you guys give us a discount there? And why is this price like this? So that's a very quick and easy way to override the price of a menu item. The next function that I want to discuss is the redirect order device, which is this button right here. Now, a lot of times it happens where we're running on limited staff and let's say that one of the stations is not manned tonight. So what happens is, let's say that the salad station doesn't have anybody there and the saute station will have to make the salads for the night. So a lot of times what I see the managers doing is going to the salad station and just turning off the printer. Now, what that will do, of course, is cause backups to print. And a lot of times these backups go to the expo station or another station, whatever it's set to. The problem with that is that you will always see an error on the screen every time a salad is supposed to print, which will annoy the servers and slow down service. And not to mention, we have no control over where the backup goes. It's just going to go wherever the default is programmed. So what we should do in that situation is actually redirect our order device. If we leave the salad station on, then our saute person will always have to run and grab the ticket. So what I'm going to do for them is I'm going to select my salad printer. Right now I see my device name here says salad and it outputs in the salad. So I'm going to click edit and then I'm going to override it to go to the saute station. So now the salad printer will go to the saute station and then the saute besides receiving their tickets, they're also going to get the salad tickets. That's also not going to cause errors on the front of our screens. Keep saying that uh, the salad is backing up and going to backup. When you are done with this, there's a little trick that you have to pay attention to when the salad station reopens. When you go back to edit, make sure you select no override. Do not select no output because if you select no output, then the printer will not print at all. So again, when you go back to normal, just go to no override and then click OK and everything will look exactly how it was before. The next function that I want to discuss is the change default revenue center function. So imagine you're in a situation where you're having a party and the whole restaurant is booked for a private party, not even open for regular guests. So you're going to need to use the POSs and maybe you want to record the sales under the bar revenue center or you might have a separate revenue center specifically 
for parties in catering so what you want to do to make sure that the revenue is tracked correctly is go to all of the workstations that are going to be used during that party or catering event and change the default revenue center to the bar or catering revenue center if you do have one and then when you're done with the party you can just change it back to restaurant and that will keep the people in accounting happy and it's going to make sure everything gets tracked correctly the next function I want to discuss is the update database function. Now you have two very functions that look kind of similar. One is called update database and one is called reload workstation database. What these two functions do, uh, specifically the update database one, basically the workstation will update its database every five minutes or so. So if a change is made in EMC, for example, somebody adjusts the price or changes a special, then you need to wait for that update to happen automatically but what happens if you need that update right away let's say that you start service uh, you want to order a special and you don't see the button on the screen you ring up your manager and say hey can you make sure that special is on the screen they make the change really quick and instead of waiting for the five minutes for the change to take effect all you have to do is click this update database button and everything will be refreshed and the last function I want to talk about is launch PMC. PMC is a diagnostic tool that will show you different pieces of information about the user and this particular workstation. So if you ever call the help desk and you're asked what version of Symfony you're running, you can run PMC and you can see the version right here I'm running is 2.10. You can also see the workstation name and number here. So if you have a hardware issue, you know how to identify it. You also see if the check-in posting server is online and if database sync is online. If any of these say offline, you might have a communication issue or loss of internet. A communication issue might also be caused by the workstations not talking to each other properly if the IP address defined here is not the same as the IP programmed in EMC. What happened here in my situation is I programmed this particular IP address in EMC and then this workstation, I switched it to DHCP, so to receive an automatic IP address, which caused the mismatch. So if you see something like this, make sure you talk to your IT person and bring that to their attention. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed today's content, make sure to leave this video a big like and comment below and let me know which one of these functions you are currently using and which one you are planning to implement in the future. Don't forget to join our free Facebook group to talk to your fellow colleagues and I'll see everyone in the next video.